Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1975 film Diary of a Neurotic Murderess. And first question is, where is the erotic aspect to this really? Um, because the title's put it saying something that is not delivering on. Not that I personally care that much because I'm not one of those people that really looks for nudity so much in films like this. I just... It's saying one thing in the title and not doing something. It also could have been kind of a different cut. I watched it on Giallo Realm, which is a channel on YouTube that has a lot of Giallo films that you can't get otherwise. So, great resource right there. Now, would I say this is full-on Giallo? I don't know. There are a lot of people who may say this isn't quite Giallo. I think it's Giallo-esque, and for that reason, it's going to be in my Giallo playlist because people who like uh, Giallo films will probably like this one, or at least find some interest in it. Anyway... Diary of an Erotic Murderess, directed by Manuel Murotti, who also did Black Sky, Fedra the Devil's Daughter, and Kill and Be Killed. Sounds like interesting titles. Also written by Murotti and uh, Emilio Martinez Lazaro, who wrote scripts for The Man in Hiding and The Dracula Saga. Sorry, I had a hard time getting that out. And also uh, Rafael Moreno Alba, who wrote Exorcism's Daughter. Stars Anthony Steffen, who you may be saying, oh, I kind of recognize the name Anthony Steffen. Anthony, Anthony Steffen was also in The Killer with a Thousand Eyes, Tropic of Cancer, and The Crimes of the Black Cat, which are Giallo films. So, doing a bunch of these types of films. Good actor, too, by the way. Uh, and actually, I will say overall, this film, pretty solid directing. Nothing like crazy awesome like a Baba or an Argento or anything like that. Um, solid enough acting. So, like, the technical stuff was was decent. Um, it's just, you know, pacing-wise, it wasn't the greatest, but that kind of happens a lot with films like this. Um, the twist, though, the twist is what really got me. So that kind of influenced my, my rating. And I did enjoy this film overall, but I'll talk more about the rating at the end. So, Mark has a problem. That's established immediately within the film, and it makes you think he'll serve as the main red herring for the film. So he kind of serves as the red herring initially and then you find out by the end he was as bad as he was kind of insinuated to be in the beginning so I love that kind of turn there where it's it's it leans so hard on him being bad in the beginning that you know having seen a lot of films like this it just immediately makes you think oh no he's not actually that bad he's actually going to turn out to be just this huge red herring and he's actually a good person and I think one of the things that really points or they try to get to point to him being a better person, is in the presence of Gina, a.k.a. Elizabeth, but I'll just call her Gina for the purpose of doing this review so I'm not switching names. Um, whenever she's around, he's good. Like, he's he does nothing bad. He has, like, the freak out with the shovel in her car, but people could definitely pass that off as, like, he's just infatuated. He's just angry. He's not hitting another person with the shovel. He's hitting an object because he's mad at her at that point because she's kind of getting with his father, basically. So, um, that whole groundwork being laid there of him, of the audience not really seeing him being that bad is kind of supposed to make the audience assume that he's not that bad. Also, the moment where, uh, what's her name? Uh, Gina. Sorry, I already lost it. The moment where Gina, ha she when she has the flowers on her shirt, and he comes in and first meets her and is kind of like stunned by her beauty at first. And then he like takes the flowers. At first you think he's going to like maybe attack her, maybe throw himself at her sexually, whatever. Uh, but no, he goes after the flowers and he kind of like cradles them and like loves them. And I think that's supposed to be another indicator to the audience that you should feel a peaceful way towards this individual. He's not dangerous. He's not an actual threat to anyone. He's just interested in the flowers. But obviously, that is the red herring, because he actually is bad in the very end. But we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Alexander doesn't think good-looking women can be professionals. But also, with how concerned he is about Gina, it comes off as he's concerned most about himself in her presence. He seems stunned that she's so good-looking. He seems like he can't believe that she's qualified for a job, which seems sexist at first. Which, you know, in in, the, in this point in time, in 1975, in, in, in uh, actually many places in the world, sexism was very rampant and not really thought of as being much of a problem, unfortunately. 
But um, so it comes off as being sexist, but it's not because in the end she wasn't qualified. You know, she said she was a psychologist, I think, and she even had documentation. But we find out that she's actually a criminal and there's no way she was actually a psychologist. And she's a grifter, basically. She's there to steal stuff. And you kind of get a hint of that it's going that direction when she's so interested in that grail uh, which, you know, first she just sees the replica in the church on, you know, Alexander's property. But then she finds out from Alexander that he has the real thing that's worth millions of dollars. And so how much they go hard on that and how much she wants to talk about that and her interest level definitely lets you know there's something else going on with Gina. And that goes to her past of being a criminal. I like how instead of changing her shirt after getting wine on it, Gina just randomly grabs the flowers Obviously, they did that to kind of lead to the moment where Mark will first meet her and take the flowers, and you get that kind of red herring of him being a docile creature. Um, but it's just weird at the time, which films like this, you know, you kind of expect a certain degree of that. But it was just kind of funny. She's just like, oh, no, I'm not going to change my shirt. I'll just, here's some flowers. I'll just throw those on my shirt and cover it up. Because that looks natural, right? <laughs> so weird. Um... When Alexander talks to Gina about Mark, he shows anger toward how he loved or how Mark loved his mother so much. So I think they do try and make another red herring out of Alexander, although initially I did think that Alexander would end up being revealed to have killed his wife. Um, it's still kind of ambiguous. He may have, we don't know, but they just don't go down that road to explain that type of stuff. So maybe it happened. Maybe she's off living somewhere else I don't know but uh yeah so Alexander I think he becomes a red herring because of how hard he goes after the his hatred for the relationship that Mark had with his mother and yeah that just uh it gets done over and over and over again you know him saying that you know, he can't stand having the flowers around, him saying he can't stand that Mark's playing the music on the piano, because it all reminds him of his ex-wife, and he had, just has so much hostility toward that. Just anything that reminds him of her, it's just like, he's off the deep end. So that insinuates that there may have been an abusive relationship there. And then on top of that, when Gina finds the diary that I do believe, at, I was questioning at one point, I'm like, was it even her diary? in the end, but no, I do actually think it was, but I'll talk more about that later. But that diary explains some really bad feelings in the relationship, uh, some abusive situations, yeah. The over-dramatized interactions of infatuation, infatuated Mark, uh, the infatuation Mark has with Gina makes me laugh, especially because they have like this this like overly dramatic piano music that goes along with it a lot of the times when those two are interacting. And he's just so crazy and over the top. And it makes me laugh. Like every time he's with her, he's just like this giddy weirdo. Yeah, it just makes me laugh. And and you kind of get the idea that he might be a little bit of a simpleton, but that's also, I think, there as, as a way to kind of throw people off the trail of him actually being a lot smarter than you would think, including Charles, who I think, Charles says that he's retarded at one point, which obviously we don't use that word nowadays, but I'm just quoting it um, from the film. But yeah, so Charles thought so as well. Is Gina working or is she treating this as a vacation? So initially when you think maybe she actually is a psychologist, you're like, is she actually going to do any work here with Mark? Because that's what she's here for. It's a job. Uh, but that obviously turns into her just kind of like walking around the grounds, uh, relaxing, um, catching people's eye. And then Alexander seems to not really care that she's not really doing the job because he's more focused on her looks and trying to get her to marry him. Because why not, you know? Uh, <laughs> but we find out that I guess it makes sense by the end because she actually wasn't really qualified to do anything with, with Mark in the first place, you know? So it makes sense that she was just cheat, treat, uh, cheating it. Cheat, yes, cheating the situation, but treating it as a vacation because what else was she going to do? She wasn't qualified to be there. Okay, this quote from Alexander. I would conquer it, buy it, or destroy it. 
I think that's another moment that's kind of supposed to lead the audience down the path of, mm, you know, Alexander's looking pretty suspicious and make you think that he probably killed his wife. Therefore, he would be able to kill other people, which would also make you kind of consider that Gina could be in a vulnerable situation, potentially a dangerous situation with Alexander with her, especially after she's reading that diary and it's sounding like a terrible relationship. And it makes the audience then kind of bond with Gina, which you're supposed to do because then it's more of a shock later when it's revealed that she's not the person you thought she was and she's not a great person either. So I do like that kind of misdirect that they use in quite a few different ways in the film. The extent of G Gina's help when Mark freaks out with the shovel was just to simply unlock the door of the room he's in and walk away. She just like unlocks, she's like, I'll take care of this, goes over, unlocks the door, like looks at him and then walks away. And like, that's it. It's just like, this is what you're getting paid for? I'm going to go back to uh, a quote from the movie Office Space. What would you say it is you do here? Not much. So Alexander didn't really see through this. I don't, he's supposed to be like some smart dude. That's how he made all his money, but apparently not. I guess blinded by love. Well, more, more likely b blinded by lust and infatuation. So there was no honeymoon period with Alexander and his wife. Uh, she immediately hated him. That's what we're led to believe from the diary, which I do think was legitimate, at least the, the beginning portions that were being read by Gina. I think that was actually the ex-wife's diary. I like the additional intrigue once Richard shows up. That's that moment where you're like, hold on a second. Gina's not who she says she is. Where is this going? Because it then takes you down the path of, okay, now she's the focal point of the evil, of being a villain. So it shifts from Alexander to Gina, still keeping us away from Mark until that very, very end portion. But obviously Richard's not a great person either, so yeah. But that's Anthony Steffen, by the way, for people who don't know. Good actor. Seems like Gina plans to string Mark along to make her planned theft go smoother, which is a cool kind of reversal because in the end you kind of realize that it seems like Gina's stringing Mark along to, you know, get in good, to kind of get the riches once Alexander's gone. But in the end you find out that it was actually Mark who was doing the manipulating in that situation. So he basically ends up manipulating Gina to get rid of... Uh, Alexander, and then he gets rid of Charles in the exact same way that she got rid of Alexander. So that kind of bonds them because if she's found out, he's or if he's if she's found out, it's for two, it would be for two murders because it's the same situation. And he's also kind of like as a symbolic gesture, being like, "Look, now I've killed someone too." So we're in the same situation. So we potentially both could be caught and we did the exact same things. So we are together now. Like you are mine. And that's legitimately what happens in the end. But I may mention that a little bit more as I get to the end of the film with my notes. I like how Gina gets the idea of how to kill Alexander from the diary. That was a cool idea. It's like she ends up living through Gina. The ex-wife ends up living through Gina. And it is interesting because you do kind of see changes in Gina as she's reading through the diary, um, you know, the little segments that they have throughout the film. So it's like she starts to become more and more and more like the ex-wife, um, taking, internalizing what she's reading and kind of like becoming those emotions and feelings, <clears throat> excuse me, and then eventually kind of acting on what she was going to act on. Although, I do believe with what's revealed at the very end of the film that it was Mark who wrote the end portions of the diary, kind of added on to him. And, because it does show that like his handwriting's the same. But, you know, I think that was kind of meant to be like, he's so bonded to his mother. You know, he plays the same music that she played. He's in the flowers like she was. So he has the same handwriting as well, which then, you know, it makes sense for the world they created. But I think that he kind of added on to it all the stuff about the idea for how to kill Alexander and was then able to influence Gina into doing that for him, which is what he wanted all along because obviously he had a terrible relationship with his father. His father just kept viewing him as a problem, you know, locking him up, 
behind the that door with the bars. It seems Gina was playing the piano and having Louisa busy to set up the body discovery. Yeah, that was um, kind of her moment after she's already put everything into motion for Alexander to be dead in the tub. She's put everything in motion, so she's just like, okay, act natural. You know, like, going over, she's she's playing the piano. Then she's like, oh, Louisa, Louisa, can you get me something? Oh, can you go Can you go check on Alexander? And then, ah, he's dead. Which, by the way, I was not ready for the face, the death face of Alexander laying in that uh, tub. Oh, my gosh. It was like the most just like wide-eyed death face I've ever seen in my life and it just I mean it looked funny like like it wasn't shocking it wasn't like scary or anything it was just funny so I enjoyed that but I wasn't ready for it it took me very much off guard I knew that the grail that like jewel encrusted grail was gonna end up playing some sort of role in the film uh because they did make that big deal out of it earlier um I think that Initially, I thought maybe it was just to show her interest in stealing stuff, but they did make such a big fuss about specifically that grail that I was like, yeah, it'll it'll end up coming back up. I thought it was maybe going to be that she would just try and steal it, which, you know, she does, but it ends up factoring in even further because it then becomes part of this plot to off Richard as well, which she does in that church by blinding him and getting him to fall into a hole which I thought was kind of funny. He just kept like kept walking as he's just like, put the light down, you're blinding me, put the light down. But just walking, knowing he can't see where he's walking. Um, not a smart dude. Didn't care when he died. I'm sure most people didn't. Uh, Gina sure does clean house, and she does it with Mark's power as her heir. You know, obviously this was all a part of Mark's plan. We figure out in the very end, but... Um, she really cleans house. You know, she's like, Louisa, you're gone. Bernardo, you're gone. Uh, anyone who would have any chance of kind of speaking against her or figuring anything out with the situation, she gets rid of them. Uh, she has the power of Mark at that point because he's infatuated with her and obviously wants to be with her. But she doesn't at that point have a clue what's really in motion, that she's basically been manipulated by Mark to off his father. Um, obviously, there's something in it for her because she sees that she wants that money and she's obviously fine with being in a relationship with mark because that's what she plays at with him ah didn't bank on charles the bastard though did you uh, i didn't see that twist coming i was like oh an illegitimate son the guy who calls himself a bastard charles the bastard shows up and complicates things and then that's why Mark has to get his hands dirty and take care of Charles because it appears to him that Gina will not go there because she's like, what do I do now? I can't get rid of this guy. He's offering me basically what I want. She ends up fully succumbing to it. You know, she's very resistant at first because, especially because of the fact that she just keeps going from terrible relationship to terrible relationship to terrible relationship. I mean, she was in that horrible relationship we find out about with Richard who was slapping her around and was holding things over her, you know, holding her passport, holding her hostage in the relationship, basically, and making her steal to get out of it. Then she gets into this relationship with Alexander, who's obviously been abusive and just a terrible person to his previous wife, based off of what's in the diary. And now she's being forced into this relationship with Charles, who also doesn't seem like a good person. And he even says, like, I don't even care if you like me. Like, I, that's not what I want. Like, I just want you to be in this relationship with me. And then you get access to all this. You know, all this money. It's yours. This wealth. So join me. And then she's just like, I mean, I guess I was going there with Mark anyway. So let's, let's go ahead and do this. The only difference is Charles is, has power over her. And she basically had power over Mark. So she didn't like the power dynamics as much. Um, I like how Charles says that the evidence of Gina killing his father will be the jewels that she was taking. How? Like, how are you going to point to that and be like, look, she was taking some jewels, she obviously murdered him. I mean, you could point at that as like a part of your theory or a part of, of adding to some sort of evidence, but that's not evidence. Like, he legitimately says, this is how I'm going to prove that you're a killer, and he like holds up the jewels. It's like... No, no, you're not. Like, you're not proving anything with that, buddy. 
Uh, just kind of funny, though. Gina just goes from one terrible relationship to another. I already talked about that. Nice twist. You just assume the diary is that of Alexander's wife, but it's added to by Mark. He was the mastermind all along. I didn't really see that coming. And whenever I don't see the ending coming like that, when they have a nice twist, I'm happy with it. I'm very excited. This actually took me up half a star rating on this. Because I was, yeah. Uh, the last thing I have to say before I give you what my actual star rating is, it's just like a very random thing that occurred to me while I was watching it. The movements and facial expressions of the actor who is playing Mark reminds me of Charlie, Bu Charlie Bucket. From um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, wait. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I believe the Tim Burton version is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is the old one. Yeah, the kid who played Charlie Bucket. I mean, watch that, then watch this, and tell me they don't seem like the exact same person, acting-wise. Like, their m motions, their movements, their facial expressions, all that stuff. Also, the fact that they were acting like spazzes, because Charlie does that. Charlie Bucket's totally like that. Anyway, this isn't about that film. So out of five stars with half stars in play, for films like this, I'm going to give this a pretty solid three and a half star rating. I enjoyed it enough. I was I was at three, like at a little bit of a week three, until that twist popped in, and I was like, oh, this changes a lot of things about the film, and it's just a cool twist. So I was like, three and a half, there it is. So I now would like to hear your thoughts on this film if you've seen it. Go ahead and put it down in the comments. Love it, hate it, in between. Let's talk about it. Also, if you just want to talk about Giallo or Italian film or horror in general, whatever, put it in the comments. Do me a favor, though. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please do that. It literally is the best way to pay me back for doing this. I don't make money doing this at this point, and I'm just kind of putting it out there to, you know, have good conversation with nerdy horror people and to be a, you know, a creative outlet because I do like talking about this stuff. So if you would please pay me back by subscribing, that would be awesome. Also hit the notification bell button if you want to know whenever I'm putting up new videos because if you watch my videos as soon as they hit, it really does help my channel out as far as views go. It can help it, it can help those videos gain traction, so I would appreciate that. But regardless, I really do thank you for taking your time to watch this, and until next time, keep it brutal.